All right, good morning. This is Sunny School, Acts chapter number 17. If your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter number 17. We're looking at the Apostle Paul reasoning for three Sabbath days out of the Scriptures, trying to prove the allegations, the alleging, right? So if you go to Acts chapter 17 and verse number 1, it says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews, of course, a learning place, a place of teaching for the Jews, and Paul, as his manner was, meaning it was a habitual thing that Paul would do, would be going into synagogues. Because as we know, like Romans chapter number 9, he has a great heaviness, continual sorrow in his heart for his fellow kinsmen, his brethren after the flesh, that he wants so, so you know, badly to believe the gospel. And as he says, he went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. And we said that reasoning is a process a, of logical thinking to come to a conclusion. And so when you look at the reasoning, you have to have, you have, to have two parts. You have to have something that is a, a fact that you're alleging, right? As you see here, opening and alleging. So meaning that he actually was using the scriptures and he's making an allegation. What is an allegation? It's something that you believe is fact, right? But somebody doesn't. You're alleging something is the case or something is true. And the other person's like, ah, I'm not so sure. So when you look at an allegation, what is the allegation in this part? The allegation is that Christ must needs have suffered. Okay. And what? And risen again from the dead that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Now, I'm just going to back up for two seconds and explain to you that it, during the time of Jesus Christ, it, the, the gospel message was not, hey, my name's Jesus, I'm coming to die for your sins, see you in a little bit, I'll be back in three days, peace, right? Like, that's not his message. His message was not, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, dying for the sins of the world, uh, I am the lamb that was crucified and slain, come unto me, you know, no, no it's, it was more about him establishing himself as the son of God, right? And, and, and proving his lineage. Now, I want to give you two verses that I want you to look at that will, will kind of demonstrate what Paul is showing you. Look at me at the book of Luke in chapter number 24. In Luke chapter 24, and hold your place in Acts chapter 17. In Luke chapter 24, there is a portion of, of the scripture that is, is always, I think to me, is like, but, but, but how does that happen? So look with me at Luke chapter 24 and look at verse number 13, okay? Actually, you know what? Let's back up just a little bit more. Go back to verse number 6. So, you know, after, after they went into the tomb, they found they did not find the body of Jesus Christ. They, 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 they see one that is, you know, face is shining. And he says, he is not here, verse 6, but he is risen. Remember how he spake. Notice this. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Don't you remember that constantly being talked about throughout the scripture? Remember, remember Christ is saying that, even in the Old Testament, he's saying that. But what is, the, what is the problem? Well, it's because there was this thing that's called it was hid from them, right? And I always go, well, how is it hid from them? What did God do? Did he magically pull, like, the wool over their eyes? Did he force them not to believe? How is it that he can say things? Remember, he tells Peter, we, we all know those verses, he tells Peter, you know, look, I'm going to die. No, no, it's not going to be so, Lord, I'm not going to let that happen, right? He, he obviously doesn't believe that that's the case. So, reading on, he says... In verse 7, saying the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna uh, the Mary, and Mary, the mother of James and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words, notice this now, I want you to really pay attention. And their words seemed to them as idle tales and they believed them not. If I were to ask you, who are the core group of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, core friends, right? Who, who are his, who are his, like, compadres? Well, the apostles, of course, but there's other people. He has other people, namely people like Mary Magdalene, right? The one who was possessed with the devils that was cast out. You have Joanna, Mary, the mother of James. and other, Yes, all of these other women are friends of Jesus Christ, and they've been with him for the last couple years. Now, you would think, if they were to believe the the gospel. And I'm, just, I'm not really getting into this particular issue of what the gospel is, but I'm trying to show you the reasoning and rationale behind why Paul is having to sit there and open and allege that Christ 
must have suffered, and, and Christ must needs have done all these things as a fulfillment of the prophecy. And they say, and their words seem to them as idle tales, and they believe them not. Well, why? What prevents belief? It's, it's really the question that we always have. It's the question, question why we sit there and have to go over the gospel message like 20 times with somebody, and they still don't believe it. You can sit there and you can be blue in the face saying, believe the gospel. Why don't you believe this? I don't understand this. And, and I told you, I, I, I talked to one of the guys today, Tony, or not this, this week, I talked to him. And uh, he randomly texted me out of the blue and said, hey, man, hope everything is well. And this is one of the guys who I was really close with in law school. We sat at the table during study sessions. And he was always like, ah, you know, I mean, I want to believe it. I mean, it's, it sounds, I mean, you're saying things that I've never heard. I mean, I grew up kind of like going to churches here and there. But, I mean, you're saying some different things about the Bible and about the gospel. And, I, and I'm, I'm so close, but, but I, just, I just don't know what. And, you know, we always try to go, well, what, what is preventing your belief, Right? What prevents belief? Well, the well, same thing here. Why is it that in here, they think of their words when they say that Jesus is risen again, and he's not there in the tomb. And, and why are they saying, oh, these are idle tales? They, don't, they think that they're lying. They're idle tales, and they believe them not. Well, we talked last week, and we kind of got into this, and I try not to get too philosophical because I think you people, not you people, I shouldn't say that, I think you get bored, right? I think I start talking about philosophy, and you're like, uh, oh, what, what, what? And my wife always tells me that. She's like, be careful, because not everybody likes all the things that you like. And I understand that. And I try, to, I try not to cater to the audience, but I try to understand who the audience is. And you may not care about ontology and, and, and philosophy. I, I understand that. And, and existentialism. I'm not really getting into all those things. But Blaise Pascal, right, was a guy who came out of the, you know, pa this is past the, really kind of into the, 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 more the crux of the Protestant Reformation, out past that, more of like the Enlightenment. People are starting to really think a lot. And Blaise Pascal... I don't know if you consider him a theoretical physicist. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, what does that even mean, a theoretical physicist? I think that's kind of one of the most ridiculous terms out there because if it's just theory, it's just theory, and who, who really even knows? But Blaise Pascal has a very famous thing called, you know, Pascal's Wager. And I think some of you guys are familiar with Pascal's Wager. In other words, hey, look, uh, it seems kind of ridiculous here that you wouldn't place the bet and the odds on believing that there is a God, right? Because... For example, if you had cancer, right, you got cancer, and they're like, hey, you know what? Uh, we got this new experimental drug. We've tried everything else. It's got a 50% chance. You want to try it? Of course you're going to try it, right? It's a great wager. You're going to do it every time. Or, or let's say, you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there, there's, a, there's the lottery, and they're like, you know, I don't know. The odds here are just 50-50. You sure you want to play? Of course you're going to play, right? You're always going to play that. That odds are, are tremendously beneficial, especially when what do you got to lose? So I put, I put a little bit in, and that's it, especially when it comes to the gospel. Now, I, I want to be careful in how I say this because I don't want to make it seem like, you know, you just believe and then, you know, whatever. There are costs associated with the belief of the gospel, right? Y y your conscience will be enhanced when you have the Holy Spirit. Now, if you don't ever get into any Bible-believing church and you're not instructing the way of righteousness, then probably not going to really affect you too much, truthfully. You can be justified and not really feel any different. And that's sad, but that's really the case in a lot of places. A lot of people will teach you, in a, in a, especially in an independent fundamental Baptist church, a lot of them preach the gospel. But they, they probably won't get you to a point of spiritual maturity, right? Because they're going to legalize you. But in, in Pascal's wager, you know, they're always going, hold on, hold on. What is the, what is the dilemma here? Now, I'm going to read this part for you here. Uh, um, some of you guys are familiar with Peter Kreeft. Some of you, another kind of like... Uh, I don't want to call him really a philosopher, but he's kind of a philosopher to an extent. But, but he, he said, you know, hey, think about it like this, right? Pascal's answer, right? I'm just going to read some of this. He says, Pascal answers the objection, which is, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. If we're just believing this whole thing just to save our own skin, right? If you're just going to believe the gospel just so you don't have to go to this place called hell and torment, isn't that really kind of selfish? Right? Well, we're, we, if you change the motive to, whoa, 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 if there is a God, isn't it very unjust of you not to believe? Isn't it really kind of a slap in his face to not believe him? Right? You see, it's kind of like, it's focus shifting away from you and on to, and really what you have to do is look at, instead of forcing people to believe into it, you're, you're forcing people to believe out of what they already believe in. Does that make sense? Because I'm going to read this with you, and it's pretty good. It says, if you are unable to believe, it is because of your passions, since reason impels you to believe, and yet you cannot do so. 
Reason compels you to take the chance and believe in the odds of a creator, a creation, your moral conscience, right? So we know the two, the two testimonies of God that are most evident are creation and conscience. And those two things, you go, okay, well, yeah, how else did that come to be? And we're going to look at the ultimate cause today. Some of you guys are familiar with maybe some of that. But, but going to this and going, okay, well, if you don't believe, it's because you have something else that you believe. Something is replacing that belief. And he says it's because of the passions, since reason you believe, and yet you cannot do so. Now, notice this. I think this is really important. I do this all the time, and I didn't even realize I did it. I always say, well, what do I have to prove to you to believe that there's the God? Or what do I have to prove to you to believe the gospel? But in other words, I've also kind of taken it in the negative, and what prevents your belief? What is it that's, what is the, hum, the, the, the hurdle or the stumbling stone or the block that's preventing you from actually believing the gospel, right? Because if I believe it, why don't you believe it? Well, he says, concentrate then on convincing yourself by multiplying the proofs of God's existence, which is always, you know, we can keep doing that. I feel like that's all we do. Oh, well, we got this, and, and then we can show you this, and how about DNA, and RNA, and the stars, and the creation, and, you know, you go through all these things, and your conscience, and, and, and absolute morality, and, and absolute truth, and you're like trying just to jam things down their throat, but there's something in the way that's preventing them from accepting that. Make sense? And you have to figure out what is that problem. What is preventing the belief? Well, we know what it is. Ultimately, it's, it's Satan. Right? It's obviously they're believing the lie of the devil that there's something else there. But he says, I think this is really important. He says, convincing, con con concentrating then, then not on convincing yourself by multiplying proofs of God's existence, but by diminishing your passions. Because there's things that people do, and, they, and I, I said this last week, people make time to do the things that they want to do, and it took me, took me years to figure that out. I will truthfully tell you that I cried one time. This is probably in my early 20s i had a friend of mine who was a really good friend and i was inviting him to do stuff and we're doing things and like he just never wanted to do stuff i'm like this is ridiculous dude i thought you were like one of my best friends high school friend you know but i kind of realized we grew apart and i remember telling my wife i was just so frustrated i'm like dude i invite him to this doesn't come ask him to do this doesn't come says he's gonna come then doesn't show up and i'm like this is ridiculous this is so annoying why they do this and i i finally kind of like that was probably a time i just started thinking about it and i'm like you know what? People make time to do the things that they want to do. He really doesn't want to come. And it took, a, I was like, wow, that kind of hurt. Like, that was, that was a lot for me to swallow at 21 years old. I was like, wow, I guess, you really, I guess he's not as much of a friend as I thought he was. And so when, you, when you, people make time for the things that they want to do, the passion that they have, if, if people want to find faith, right, how, how are you going to do it? No, basically, if you want to be cured of unbelief, you have to, you have to basically try to convince yourself out of what you already believe. Does that make sense? There's already a belief structure there. You already have faith. It's in something else. Make sense? It's already there. You, I don't care. Faith in logic and faith in reason and faith in science are not mutually exclusive. You are all believing something by faith. And I'm going to tell you the number one reason why is this. Everything that any scientist tells you, I don't care who they are, I don't care what scientists they are, right? They are, they are making an assumption on every level. And the reason why is it goes like this. I can take you back to the very beginning. Jason Tripp exists, and we're going to do big, bold steps here, but for my parents, right? And but for my parents going to Plant High School, and but for my dad being a car head and my mom being a cheerleader and but for my dad wooing my mom with his Camaro and my mom wanting to go for a ride in the Camaro. And, and you see, but we can go even further back. And, and but for my parents' parents, my grandparents, my dad's dad, you know, finding my dad's mom. I and mean, these are these are big overarching things. You follow me? There's there's so many other things that go in between that. And you can start going but for. Now we're just not talking about genealogies here. We're talking about the history of the world. And but for me not being a Jew and be, you know, I didn't get exterminated. All these different things, big, huge with World World War Two, World War One, you know, Civil War. Go back in history and all these but fors. You ultimately come back to what? Okay, but for Abraham having some kids and but for Noah having some kids and but for Adam having some kids but but for 
what's before Adam, but for, I don't know, but for some, you know. You, you realize that ultimately you can only go so far back before you have to start making radical assumptions. And these radical assumptions are treated as fact by every scientist out there, and they will tell you that these assumptions are absolutes. And when you go, they're not absolutes. You're making assumptions. So when I tell you that you have to prove the person out of their faith, you just say, look, you already are having faith in believing in something else. You're putting something above that level. And so the assumption that they will make most often is that we came from somewhere, but we can't explain it. I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't print it off. I wanted to. Um, the, the Richard Dawkins interview, which I know you guys have seen that. Uh, Dawkins, who's another theoretical physicist. This all comes down, I want to explain to you that it comes down from two things. It comes from a hatred of God is the reason why most of these individuals do not believe and they pr promote and perpetuate their false science, right? They promote rational thinking. Well, well, we promote reasonableness. I mean, Richard Dawkins will probably tell you, don't teach your kids anything about religion. Teach your kids to be open-minded. What do you mean? That's how we get 14 different types of bathrooms, right? I mean, it's the truth. I mean, sorry, you were born like that. That's what you got. It's to deal with it. But that's not how it works nowadays. No, I'm sorry. That's not how it is. You want to be whatever you want to be. You can be whatever you want to be. I told you last week that I identify as an Apache helicopter. I'm an Apache helicopter. I want that on my driver's license. You say that's ridiculous. Well, it's just as ridiculous as saying that I'm a girl, isn't it? I mean, if you think I'm crazy, but you just wait. You wait. You wait like two, three years. There won't be a male or female on a birth certificate anymore. You don't get to do that. That is, that is so discriminatory. How dare you? But what is that doing? It's taking away, in my opinion, the absolute truths and proofs of God. See, God lays out those boundaries of what is what and what is what, right? He says, no, 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 I, I lay out this is male. I lay out that this is female. I establish how procreation occurs. Now, you want to change it to your own definition. You can try to change these definitions, but it doesn't change the fact that what I set and establish is always going to be there. I'll tell you right now that monogamous marriage, right, between heterosexual couples is the most superior relationship on the planet, sans God. Why? Because we're the only ones that can procreate. I mean, society as a whole requires and wants procreation. They do. They want it. They, they desire procreation. They need procreation. You realize we didn't even have a billion people until like 1812 or whatever it was? I mean, think about that for a second. And now we have 7 billion people in, in, in less than 200 years? I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. You see how fast we're exponentially growing? Obviously, people are creating babies. How are they doing that? Through heterosexual relationships. It's the only way it's going to happen. Sorry. It's just how it works. And so if you want to get into the issue of besides God, the, the heterosexual relationship is superior. And I'm sorry, but, but the discrimination is natural. It's not from me. I didn't discriminate against you. I don't care. You can do whatever you want to do. I'll tell you it's wrong. But the discriminatory nature is from nature. Follow me? That it's, it's built there. So when somebody says, well, you're being discriminatory. No, I'm not. I don't you. God aside, you can't do what we can do, right? So we should have the, the priority and in, in the, in the preeminence in those things. Now, obviously, that's, a, that's an aside, but those are, those are the issues now that we're going to start getting away from the distractions of the world and more and more of these, just be more open to, to these issues. And let's not talk about anything that's absolutes. Yet at the same time, we're going to treat every assumption on the planet as an absolute. It's so ridiculous. Do you realize that they have to assume? And I give you this example all the time. I'm going to draw on the board because I don't know if some of you, I don't know if some of you have seen this. But this is this is my example. And I, I did this one day, and my dad was like, "You need to put this in a book." I'm like, "I don't know if I need to put it in a book. I just think it's the most the most obvious thing ever." Like, so it, let, let's say the most the most uh, common example would be the tree ring, right? People have heard that all the time. Tree ring. Tree rings demonstrate the world is, you know, I was just on a boat with a guy. He was telling me that the world's 500 million years old or something. I'm like, I looked at him and was like, dude, what's the difference between 500 and 400 million? How do you quantify that? And he's like, oh, what do you mean? I'm like, how do you quantify 500 million versus 400 million? Because that 100 million is a big disparity. And how do you know it's 480 million, not 475 million? 
or maybe it's not even 400. You know, do you see how ridiculous it kind of is? But let me just show you this. So what they'll say is they'll say this, and just pay attention. This is this is kind of important. If you look at a tree, and they'll say, well, there's these little rings, right? And each one of these little rings, okay, is a gap. And in this little gap, right here, let's say, well, we, we, we could see that, and that was every 50 years, right? Okay, cool. Oh, great. Awesome. All right. Well, let me ask you this. So let's say it's 50 years in these little gaps in the thing. I'm just using a, a round number for ease of math. And let's say the average human can live to be 75 years. Just making something easy, okay? No, let's, make, let's say you can live 100 years, because that makes it even easier. This guy can live for 100 years long. Well, how many rings can that guy physically observe? He can observe two. Two, he can, he can observe the first one and the second one. Okay, cool. Well, guess what? There's more rings. And there's like another ring. Okay, so what do you do? Oh, well, uh, you know, my dad was also a scientist, and he wrote in his book all about this. Cool. Did you see it? No. My dad saw it. Okay, did he record it good? Oh, yeah, I believe he did. You believe he did. So you have faith that your dad wrote down and recorded the things that you saw. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. Great. Great. Okay. Okay. Now, how far back are we going? Well, his grandpa, too, was also, you know, he lived to be 100, and he lived to be 100, and his great-grandpa lived to be 100, and then, and then his great-great-great-grandpa lived to be 100, and, and we got, you know, six generations. Cool. You got 600 years. Well, what happens before that? Uh, well, um, um, well, we, uh, we, uh, they don't want to use the word believe. Well, they don't want to use the word we assume. So they say, and as a result, all of the 50 years, it goes like this. And so we count them all up and therefore we have this many rings and therefore it's that many years. And you're like, well, how do you know that? That's a big assumption. That's a wild assumption to say that every one of these is going to be there. Well, we observed it that way for six years. Or for six generations, for 600 years. Okay, I get that, but this is all assumption. You don't know that because you didn't see it. And what happens if at year 500, all of a sudden at year 500, it goes, doo -doo -doo -doo, and it does like 20. You don't know that. It, may, it very well could. Well, that's kind of ridiculous. Well, why is it ridiculous? Don't you understand that this is an assumption? But what do they treat the assumption? They want to treat the assumption as being absolute fact. That's a fact. No, that's an assumption based upon an allegation, based upon partial evidence. And when you have the partial evidence, all you get is a partial conclusion. You don't necessarily know that that's the case. So again, people read like Richard Dawkins, or they read, um, who's the other astrophysicist? The guy I was just reading, not, not, um, not the Stephen Hawking, the other guy, I can't remember his name, Kra Kraus, whatever his name is. You know, people read these books and I've heard him, oh, I read it, and you know what? It opened my eyes up to being reasonable and rationalism. And I'm like, no, no, it didn't. It, it, they all start with a hatred of God. Richard Dawkins, beginning of his book, is all about hatred for God. In particular, hatred for the Judeo-Christian God, the God of the Bible. He hates that God. Why? Why does he hate him so much? Well, look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 15. I believe in my heart that every single individual who is not justified and understands their eternal justification has a problem right here. Hebrews chapter 2, in verse number 15, it says, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Well, why are people afraid of death? Because it's the fear of the unknown, allegedly. It's the allegation that it's the fear of the unknown. We don't know what happens past that. So as a result, we were fearful of it. People are always afraid of things they don't know, right? I just had a, one of the girls that babysits for us. She was going crazy about taking a cruise. She's like, I am so nervous. I can't even imagine it, right? And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you know, going out on this boat or going in the middle of the ocean. What happens if this happens? And what happens if Titanic happens? And, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, your, your, your imagination's running a little crazy here. I'm pretty sure Titanic's not going to happen. These ships are a lot more stable than you think they are. But it's the fear of she's never been on one of those trips before. So she's absolutely just can't, can't comprehend it. So what we try to do in, in our presentation of the gospel, I think so hard, is like we try to jam the gospel down people's throat. And don't get me wrong, that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, but it's the prevention of the belief. And people say, well, you know what, Jason? You can't make people believe the gospel. 
oh, well, I can, be, I, can, I can work real hard at being convincing and persuasive, and we absolutely should do that. Look at the book of Colossians, chapter number 4. Colossians chapter 4, and verse number, we'll start at the beginning. Master is given to your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be alway with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. You understand that there is a preparation that goes before the presentation of the gospel? I've told people before, oh, you know, you've never really had somebody cheat your head off about the gospel? Probably not sharing it enough, but that's understandable. I get it. You know, it's uh, most of the time people don't want to talk about things that they're not super up to par with. And my wife will tell me, well, no, not everybody could be like you, Jason, and, and, and be Mr. Lawyer, Mr. You know, Wordsmith, Mr. Logical. Well, hold on a second. You know, and I'm like, it's not about that. It's not about your flesh either. It's about if you have some basic, fundamental, these things can be explained to a, a fifth grader. And they can understand it. We're not, we're not getting into, you follow me, we're not getting into theoretical mathematics or something. We're not getting into, you know, quantum physics. None of the things that I've talked about is very difficult to understand. It's all very simplistic. But it's trying to establish that people already have a faith. And see, what prevented the belief there in Luke chapter 24 with those girls and those guys, and they didn't believe it? Look with me back there at Luke chapter 24. Look at this. See, if you don't believe something, you believe something else. And in Luke chapter 24, this, this is showed to us. Look at this. Verse 13. And behold, two men went that same day to a village called Emmaus. This, this is Luke 24, 13. Which was from Jerusalem about three, three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that you have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And, and the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto them, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And, and, and he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Where was their belief? They had belief. They had faith in Christ. It was not in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, but they had faith in who he was. They thought it was going to be he who would redeem Israel. And reading on, he says, Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. Remember? We just read that. They came in, they said, Hey, the body's gone. And they're all like, Yeah, those are idle tales. We don't believe that. He's dead. We trust that that was going to be he that was going to redeem Israel. It's not going to happen. And he says, and, and, and they found not his body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Did they believe any of that? Notice this? They didn't believe any of that? You follow me? They're trying to convince them that, hey, you know, you, 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 we're trying to convince you that there is something to believe, but there's something that's preventing your belief, which is your belief in something else. You're putting faith in something that is not as superior. And he says, a certain of them which were went out with us went to the sepulcher and found that even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Okay, so you see how all the evidences for the proof of the resurrection and him being gone, and yet these guys still don't believe? Well, look what Christ says. Then he said unto them, notice this, O fools, and slow of heart to believe, notice that word, all that the prophets have spoken. So when the Apostle Paul goes in to that synagogue there in Thessalonica, what does he do? He's very rational. He says, whoa, whoa, whoa. You guys don't believe all that the prophets have spoken? You do. He, he, you notice that he doesn't have to sit there and establish the authority of the word of God, right? 
Our problem today is we have to start way, way back. What is our biggest dilemma now? We're starting back at square one. We're starting back at the very basics. The even idea of an intelligent designer and a creator. I mean, get real, folks. If you have to go that part, you might as well be like, oh, this guy's, this guy's so far gone. I don't know if you can even... You following what I'm saying? That we have to even get to the issues of a creator and conscience and morality before we can even get to the gospel. You can't give somebody the gospel and they go, I don't even believe there's a God, right? What do they care? You have to prove that there's a God to them. And how ridiculous is that? I showed you last week, and actually, hold your, hold your place in Luke chapter 24, in Acts chapter 17, turn there and look at this, okay? In the, in the days of old, nobody was dumb enough to say there's no God, right? See, it's, now it's a role reversal. Our world is so ridiculous that they're trying to take all the things that are bad, right, and make them good. And all the things that are good and, and make them bad. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You look and go, Where, what, is, what is this? Where am I living? What planet is this kind of stuff, right? And if you think for a second that all of these politicians, I mean, you know, Nate and I have talked about this. These politicians are so, they're so two-faced. They don't, they don't care about you. You know, 1994, Hillary Clinton is, a marriage is between a man and a woman, right? Gay marriage is not right. We're not going to put up with that. And now, oh, gay marriage, let it go, let it fly. Why do I talk about that? Because it's the most prolific thing in the news today, right? It's just going everywhere. It's, they're trying to force it down your throats to the extent now that you're going to have, you know, bathrooms for, what do you, it's just, that's just the most ridiculous thing ever. My kid's going around back to the trees. I mean, that's how it's going to happen. Uh, Acts chapter 17, notice this. When Paul goes to a place uh, in, in verse number 22, Paul goes to a place in Mars Hill, and he goes to Athens, Okay. Now, notice what he doesn't do. You dumb idiots who don't believe in any gods. No, 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 no. They absolutely understand that there has to be a god. Have you ever heard uh, Tim Allen at all? You know who Tim Allen is? The guy from Tool Time? Right? That guy? So, you know, that guy was, uh, he's got a very interesting life. And if you listen to his testimony, it's pretty interesting. And... He got involved in, uh, in drugs, and he, he actually was in prison for like two years for coke. And uh, when he got out, he got an offer from Disney. He's like, I like dude, I was, do you understand who I am? Disney's the family channel. I don't know if you want me. I'm not really the family guy. You know, but his, his stand-up routine was kind of like the typical all-American dad. You know, like just that kind of, you know, I got a couple kids. I've got my, you know, my middle-income job, uh, you know. And so... What I what I noticed and what he said was, the girl goes. The interviewer says, "Well, so you're telling me that you know you believe that there's a God?" And he was like, yeah, well, ab "Absolutely, yes, yes, with, without a doubt." He goes, "It's it's undeniable," and I'm thinking to myself, "It is undeniable." And when people deny it, you're just ridiculous. And he said, "For me, I, I started to really look around and and go, this is way too complicated." for me to just have this happen. This is way too complicated for the, the way that I think and the emotions I feel and the things that go on in my life. And, uh, and he said, I was ultimately looking for a purpose. And I thought that was really cool. I said, that's interesting. Now, of course, they didn't get into the details of his belief structure, and I have no idea what he truthfully believes. But, it, but you know, here is an outspoken individual who does believe there's a God. It's like Steve Harvey. We've given you that example, too. You know, Steve Harvey, another guy who gets the absolute flame on from everybody for saying that there's a God. And on his interview, on, he did one on Larry King, he did one on CNN. And they approached him, and, uh, and Rachel Maydow, which I absolutely cannot stand that girl. She is just the... Uh, She's just, she's just out of control. But that's, that's, the, that's the news for you. And so Rachel Maydow is interviewing him and saying, well, hold on, I'm reading something from your book that says that, that girls should not date guys who don't believe in there's a God. And he just, not even like a hesitation, goes, yeah, why would they? And she's like, well, isn't that a little ridiculous? And he's like, well, no, what's, what's ridiculous is not believing that there's a God, you know? He's like, I don't want to wait. And he goes, He's, his favorite word, he always says moral barometer. He goes, where's their moral barometer? He's like, I don't want, if I was a girl, I wouldn't want to date any guy who doesn't believe there's a God. Where's, where's his moral barometer? What's he going to do? He, he, got, he, he can do whatever he wants to do. He's not going to hold back in anything. He could do whatever he wants to do. He's a bad person. And so Maida was like, so it's a bad person not to believe there's a God? Well, yeah, no accountability. And it's really interesting. That's the reason why I, I do get from most people that they don't want to believe there's a God is because there's no, there's no accountability then. Truthfully, when you get older and you're a little kid, what is the worst part about being a little kid? Having to listen to your parents. And you're like, listen to my parents again? And they got to tell me more stuff, the things I got to do? And as you get older, what is it? You're like, yeah, no accountability. Yes. 
That's what you want. You move out of the house and you're like, ha, I can do whatever I want, suckers, right? And then you start to realize like, ooh, that's not a good idea. I was making some really bad decisions. And hopefully you learn from that, but accountability is a good thing, right? Having somebody that is helping you by, by, by teaching you and instructing you is, is not a bad thing. In Acts chapter 17 and verse number 22, he says, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious, for as I passed by you and beheld your devotions, notice this, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. See, they believed that there were, so, that there were gods, and they were so concerned about making sure that they did what? They appeased God. They did not want to offend God. Right? They knew that there had to be a God, and just in case they had all these other little gods, in case we missed one, in case it really is the alien in the sky, we're going to put to the unknown God so at least they know, hey, we did want to reverence you, we just didn't know your name. Right? And Paul says, him I declare unto you. And he says it here. He says, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. See, notice this. Whom therefore you do what? You ignorantly worship. So they do worship a God. See, when you worship yourself, technically you're worshiping God because you're worshiping the creation. And you're saying, hey, this is God. You, you, by being a creation of God, come from God, right? And that's that ultimate issue. That's that ultimate, that, that's that ultimate question that we have to come back to is the existence of man. I encourage you to go watch the movie Expelled by Ben Stein. It's a great movie. It's a very, a very good documentary. And it goes through the issues of no intelligence allowed. And he just is trying to prove intelligent design versus evolution and the Big Bang and, 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 the, and the theories behind all that stuff, which is just the most ridiculous thing ever, you know, to, to, to think and imagine that something blew up and then the whole world came to be as it is right now. When, when does anything, I've said this repeatedly, if you go, and I didn't, if I didn't have, if I have a house, right, and I didn't take care of it for a year, I just, I just, I just left. I'm like, I shut the doors, I locked it, and I left. And I came back a year later. Would it look amazing? Would everything be all manicured and everything look all perfect? No, it looked like a horrendous mess, right? The, the le there'd be leaves all over my roof. It'd probably be rotted because all the water had been drained up in the roof. There's just all kinds of problems. When does you know, lack of order create, or when does disorder create order, I should say? Never, never, ever, 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 ever. But that's what they want you to believe when they have the Big Bang and all the rest of those things. Look with me over at Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Here's another good example of this. In, in Deuteronomy chapter number 4, when all the other nations of the world hear about the God of Israel, they don't go, God of Israel? Oh, he doesn't even exist. He's an idiot. Yeah, these guys are stupid for believing there's a God. So they told you, we have a huge problem today that we're just trying to establish that there's a God with people. I mean, to me, that's the most ridiculous thing that I have to actually prove to you, that there's a God. Are you, are you for real? In the words of that one dude, you are dumb. So really, really dumb for real. And those who are younger may get who that guy is. But, you know, read with me. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse number 5. Behold, I have taught you the statutes and the judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land, whether you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? In what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? You ever heard the thing, the, the phrase in Ephesians chapter 2 called the middle wall of partition? That God, is, that God has broken down the middle wall of partition? That's the middle wall of partition. It's what separates the Gentile from the Jew. The Jew has this law, the instruction of righteousness, and, and, the, and the Gentile goes, man, you know what our gods do? Nothing. They just sit there on the little counter. You know what your God does? He tells you everything to do down to the T. And he fights on your behalf. And you guys win a lot of battles. And you're a great nation. He says, what nation is so great? Who hath God so nigh unto them as Lord our God is in all things? You know, in my opinion, reasonableness lends itself to the belief in God. Reasonableness. Let's all be reasonable here. Reasonable people. That's what Pascal's Wager is about. It's about being reasonable. It's about being rational. It's about, you know, r rationalism is, they, they, they call it the reasonable person standard, right? If you, get the, if you get a vast majority of people together and you say, well, is this a reasonable thing to do? Well, how do, you, how do you determine what reasonableness is, right? It's kind of a little bit of subjective to each person. So the way I determine reasonableness is based upon the objectivity that is instinctual 
right, is the natural, and I explain that there's the nurture versus natural, and that the, 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 the institutions of today are all about nurture to teach you the, that the natural is wrong and that we're going to nurture you to teach you that this is this new way, right? Case in point example, you're not really a girl because that, that would be the natural way. We have to do what? We have to nurture you to tell you that it's okay, right? I've said this repeatedly. If I walk down the street and I come up to, um, we, let's come up to a, a, a married couple sitting at a, at a patio outside eating dinner. And I come up to the guy and I said, you are so gay. Is that going to be a, a signifier of praise? Is that a, is that a laudatory compliment? No. Is somebody going to get really offended if you call them that? Right. Why? Because deep down inside, they all know that that's wrong. They go, no, 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 no. I'm definitely not gay. Well, why? Why are you not gay? Shouldn't you be proud of that stuff? Yikes, right? Now, I might be picking on that for a little bit, but the reason I am is, is it's, it, I, I must come in contact with that on a, on a weekly basis with somebody. I remember when Nate was telling me that he, you, you were at the, uh, that one office and Beth was, Beth's son is gay and Nate got Chick-fil-A and brought it into the office and the girl goes, Chick-fil-A, I can't believe you eat there. And he's like, what are you talking about? It's Chick-fil-A. He goes, oh, yeah, they, they hate gays. Uh, no, they, they don't hate gays. Uh, oh, they, if they want to have a, 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 a belief about the, the, the natural world and, and what it means to be gay versus what it means to be straight. I always think that's funny too, straight versus gay. Like, straight, don't you want to be straight? And that's kind of what you want to be, not queer or crooked, uh, whatever. I could go for hours on that subject matter, but it's one that's very interesting. In sum, I'll leave you with that. this, is that it's just like any other uh, sin that comes from Adam, right? It's just like any other sin that comes from Adam, okay? Uh, lust, adultery, pornography, gay, whatever you want to do. It's all the same stuff, right? It all come. It's all, it's all the, the, the lust of the flesh. It all comes from the same thing. So if you have that problem, the predisposition to that, it's no different than somebody who has a problem with lust. Okay, let's, let's focus on not acting on it, right? You follow me? So it's like if we said if we brought a, uh, if we had a, an openly, um, uh, an adulterer in the, in the service. I'm saying somebody that, that came in and sleeping with somebody else's wife and says, you know, I'm sleeping with this other guy's wife and I don't think it's wrong at all. And he wants to sit in the, in the pew. And he wants to sit there and we say, no, get out of here. You can't do that. We're not going to allow that, right? Those that sin, rebuke before all the others in the pew. You're not, we're not going to put up with that. However, what, what the, the, the issues with, with the, 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 the gay culture and that, that phenomenon that's going on is they want you to be, they want to be accepted and they want to allow that. They say, we want this to, we want to be accepted in your congregation. You just wait and just give it another year and you watch these big mega churches and you watch what's going to happen. You watch. The gravy train's going to run out unless they bring them in. And they'll say, Jesus loves everybody. And it's like, okay, that is a true statement, but not in the way you're saying it. Uh, I repeatedly tell you to please listen to the sermon I preach called Let Love Be Without Dissimulation. And so dissimulation, if you, do, if you don't rebuke others of sin, that's loving without that dissimulation, you know. I'm not saying that any of us here are without sin. But it does not change the fact that all of us, I think, believe that we should mortify the deeds of the body. That we should reckon ourselves dead and deed in the sin, but alive in the Christ. That's a struggle, folks. That's not, a, that's not something you're like, oh, yeah, I'm doing great at that. <laughs> I never sin ever. I never do anything wrong. That's, that's obviously, you know. John, First John says, if you save in our sin, you save ourselves, right? And the truth is not in us. So th this is becoming really a big promulgation of what's happening. But reasonableness lends itself, we're almost done, two minutes here, reasonableness lends itself to the belief in a God. I personally believe that it promotes faith. That reasonableness promotes faith. Because, as I said at the beginning, we're looking for individuals who, who now, if you, if you can find somebody that believes in a God, whew, whew, okay, wow, that's much easier, right? Because if you don't believe in there's a God, you really only have a few things to do, okay? Look around you. You don't believe in the creation? No, that came from the Big Bang, and that came from the evolution, and the dirt, 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 dirt. And you're like, well, give me some good examples of evolution, transspecies evolution. And they're like, oh, bro, the butterflies, and they don't know. They have no clue. They, trust me, they have no idea. I'm telling you, they have no clue. Go talk to these people. They have no clue. You... I think that what destroys people's faith is they think that these people really have like this stuff on lockdown. They really know it. They don't know it at all. They have no clue. And Scott's shaking his head because he's talked to some of these people. I've talked to some of these people too. I think that 
you know, buddies of mine that are like, oh, you're so crazy, believe in God, and we get in this discussion, and I'm like, you got, you're just so far off left base, I can't even, there's not even a bother talking to you. And I ask people all the time, at the end of the day, if, if you don't believe in there's a God, you should go out and rape, pillage, steal, murder, do whatever you want to do. Just do it. Get ahead in life, man. Do what you got to do to get ahead, because it doesn't matter. There's no judgment day. There's nothing wrong, but they don't do it because deep down inside, they have a conscience. And their conscience, as I said, as you're, when you're a little tiny kid, your conscience eats you up. And as you get older and the more you sin, the more you allow it, and the more you let the world pervert you, you start to get less and less and less, you know, affected by sin. And you start to allow it and you allow it and you allow it more. And that's, that's the sinful reality of the world. And I personally think, my personal opinion on this, why God introduced the dispensation of grace at the time he did. Because he knew how perverted and ridiculous the world was going to get. And he's like, this is basically your last chance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer grace to every single individual. Your opportunity is to believe now. After that, go read the book of Joel and the book of Amos and see what happens next. Because it ain't pretty. And I would really not want to live in that dispensation. All right, let's close in our prayer. Dear God, again, we thank you.